Hi, everyone who's out there. Um, I'm Adrian Jackson, uh, Director of Cardboard Citizens, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to, I think, the seventh of our series of conversations with practitioners around the world who work with the theater of the oppressed in different countries and different methodologies. And the common factor of all the people I've spoken to so far is that they have been founders of companies. Um, and that's the case today. Also, um, I'm speaking to Kok Heng Leung, um, but who's the founder, he goes by Heng, by the way, um, but also with his colleague and associate director, uh, Hu Ling Ko, who goes by Ko. Um, so this is the first conversation we're having with two people at one time, uh, who work with the company Drama Box in Singapore, um, and which is a company uh, as old, even older, I believe, than Cardboard Citizens, but we can find out about that imminently. So uh, welcome, Heng and Co. Are you there? Hi. Hello. Hi, Hi. Both Hi. Hello, hello. Hello. What a great pleasure to have you here, and thank you so much for making the time to talk to us uh, and broaden out this interesting conversation we've been having. Uh, we've now got a format for these conversations, which is essentially for the first half of the conversation, I'm gonna gently prod you with a few questions, uh, interrupt from time to time with a finger raised in the air. Um, and all the while that is going on, hopefully people uh, listening, watching on the web will be feeding us questions. And in the second half, I will feed you those questions. Um, so welcome, hope that's all okay. Um, so uh, Hang, you founded a Drama Box. Um, and tell us a little bit, first of all, well, which comes first, the founding of Drama Box or the discovery of the theater of the oppressed as, as a tool in your armory? Uh, the, the founding of the Drama Box came first about 30 years ago. Uh, so we were a group of undergraduates who graduated from the university and we decided to make theater uh, as a hobby. So we started really as a amateur group. Uh, so people would work in the day and then do theater in the night. But I only discovered uh, Forum Theatre in 93, when uh, I was working in full time in another theatre company called The Necessary Stage. And the founder of that two companies went to New York and uh, attended uh, a workshop by Boha, Augusto Boha. And that was in 93, they brought back uh, Forum Theatre and I was involved in that production uh, as a lighting designer. And as well as, uh, you know, as I was watching the whole thing, and then uh, after that, uh, in that company, we started to bring uh, forum theater to schools. And we even had plans to bring it to factories, to housing estates. And then before you know it, uh, some journalists started to write about this, this form as being a Marxist form. And they were investigating the company. And before you know it, uh, I think in 94, that's when then we, well, the government decided to give a de facto ban to the form. So I know I'm just going to come to that a little bit later, but I know <laughs> that uh, because it's a great story and Augusto was so proud. He was so proud that yes. um, Forum Theatre was considered a dangerous enough form that a government in one country would seek to ban it. Um, but let's return to that in a moment. And if I could ask Ko about when she joined the company and her particular mm. area of responsibility and, and her focus also on TO. Mm. Uh, so for, for me, actually, my first exposure to the Theatre of the Oppressed was after I was uh, freelancing with Drama Box. Uh, for one of the uh, outdoor performances. And uh, actually, my former life's training with NTO was with you, Adrian, <laughs> in 2005. So I went over to London and, uh, yeah, and then, of course, then the second week where we have the Joker's workshop with Augusto and realised that my birthday is just two days away from him. So like, wow, you know, <laughs> we share the same, you know, horoscope. <laughs> yeah. So uh, then subsequently, I guess uh, for Hing and I, when we are working with Dropbox, uh, my area of uh, focus is uh, usually with the young people 
in F, in the, at the beginning it was uh, in uh, educational institution. So working with young people using TO and farm theater in schools, uh, and then uh, subsequently evolved into uh, going into community spaces, uh, and then uh, working with. Uh, direct communities as performers as well. So I think here in Singapore, I remember Barbara was sharing that hey, it's quite interesting because we have two kinds of ways of doing it. One is with the direct community itself, which is how TO has been. Uh, but we also actually were with actors uh, and then getting the actors to uh, share and tell the stories through the performance. Yeah, so that's how it has been uh, for us here in Singapore. So I can come back to some of those points. I'm interested to know uh, hang out how what proportion of your work is is to based is it is it everything or are there other methodologies you also use i i think uh it's it's it, to is not everything to it uh we i think we are very careful when do we use uh for example forum theater uh, but what is important is that i think to plus uh, paro ferry's uh, pedagogy of your press has informed in uh, the way the company works, especially the way we create dialogic experience through the work that we do. So we've been doing a lot of uh, participatory work where if you look at it essentially, uh, we were really looking at Freris and Boals, you know, talking about what dialogic means, uh, that kind of uh, interaction that allows people to unpack, to be critical and to learn the skills of organizations. And I think one of the strong things about PO was actually not only about thinking about solutions, but learning how to organize, learning how to unpack, learning how to be critical. So we actually brought this these things into a lot of our work. Mm -hmm. so that's very interesting. Uh, it's very interesting that you focus on Ferrari. A lot of mm -hmm. people forget about Ferrari because, as it were, Augusto borrowed the term and the name, and mm -hmm. and it's a theatre work. Um, I'm interested to know. Uh, really specifically about uh, groups that you work with and how you deploy the Frarian uh, or, or Balarian uh, methodologies to create that dialogue and, and why? How do you choose who you work with? I could go to either of you. Uh, shall, shall, I, shall, I, shall I start with Ko and then Hang? I'm interested. I, I think when by the time I joined Drama Box, uh, actually, uh, I think one of the first few projects that I was involved in, uh, actually, I was the actor performer, so the actor facilitator in the show. Uh, uh, but subsequently, I think uh, most memorable, uh, soon after, we were working with a direct uh, two direct groups of community, actually three, in that same year. Uh, it was with the migrant community, uh, mm -hmm. and then uh, it was with a group of seniors as well as with a group of young uh, out-of-school youths. So uh, we were working with them um, uh, as co-creators during the process and then um, them being the performers and uh, bringing their stories around the different uh, housing, uh, what we call housing estates around Singapore. Yeah, so those were the three uh, first few that we work uh, specifically with the community as the performers uh, involved uh, in the performance itself. So that's the very direct kind of, if you like, pure, clear, uh, mm. classical model of a forum where the community are also the performers and they're playing back to their communities. Um, and and uh, how does that work? Uh, how long are your tours? Um, what, what What's a result for you? What's a good result for you? Uh, what's a good outcome for you? from any of those projects. For instance, the one with migrants, what, what are you seeking to achieve um, by uh, offering them theater as a space? Can you Hang. talk about that? Hang. Okay. Uh, uh, I think uh, there are two things that we need, uh, we, we try to achieve. One is whereby you allow that community to find their way to express what is important to them. Uh, at the same time, what we wanted to do is to bring their story not not just amongst the community, but bringing it out of their community to engage with uh, local Singaporeans. Uh, there have been quite a lot of misunderstanding or people you know, feeling a bit apprehensive with these new migrant workers being around them. So by putting such work in the community, uh, performing in them in housing estates, you, you allow interaction to happen on two levels. One, you see that these people are actually uh, do have another cultural space. Besides, you know, seeing them in their workspace, uh, that actually allows for a, quite a lot of uh, interaction. 
Mm. At the same time, we also work with uh, social agencies, whereby these agencies would take the piece, develop it, the piece further, and then mm. perform it within the community. Mm. So I, that this idea of how to sustain the uh, performance and sustain mm. the, the dialogue and the conversation is important in the, our approach. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, part of it is simply a sort of cultural understanding. Your migrant communities, I, I understand, are, are mainly working as domestic servants or in the building trades, construction. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and they are, I mean, tell us about them. They are very marginalized groups. Uh, your latest outbreak of COVID is in their housing and so on. Uh, th- are they very uh, discriminated against? Uh, mm. No, no, you go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, I would say that uh, they are very marginalized in a way that, uh, for example, their housing are not very well uh, taken care of. Uh, and I think the uh, Singaporeans generally do have a problem how to inter- you know finding a way to interact with them. Uh, this and there were actually quite a lot of uh, NGOs. A number of NGOs have been working and to advocate for their rights. Take for example the issue of uh, weekends uh, for domestic helpers. You know, it's still not man. It's it's still not. Uh, it took many years for it to be mandatory. Mm. You know. Uh, it took many years before a uh, domestic helper can have a day off on Sunday. I remember that. Yeah. Yes. So even for the, uh, for for construction workers, uh, you realize that the pay is not high, and uh, living conditions is not very good, and a lot of them have to pay a lot of loans. I had to take up a lot of loans to come here. So when they're here, they they would subject themselves a lot of time to very difficult working conditions. And if not, they'll be sent back. Uh, I have to say that uh, this COVID has sort of, you know, allowed these issues to surface again. And there have been more conversations about it. And let's mm-hmm. hope nobody after this COVID-19, uh, which the government has promised that they will be looking into the uh, housing issues of these mm-hmm. uh, migrant workers. And let's hope that this will be, uh, you know, they will follow through this promise. So, is it um, is the primary goal, or the I, I can see there's several goals operating at the same time, but perhaps one becomes more naturally your territory. Mm-hmm. Is the primary goal understanding of the other, um, with the hope that subsequently change will happen, or are you very much campaigning with these groups uh, mm-hmm. on a particular issue? Uh, which where does the balance lie? It, it really depends on projects, and it depends on uh, the groups that you're working with. Uh, for for migrant workers, uh, what we did was merely to create that kind of a uh, uh, a cultural experience, and right. NGOs themselves are very much on the ground and they are right. negotiating with policymakers and the government. But there are other issues whereby we find that we have to be active where we have to be involved in the advocacy, sometimes to a certain point, we must also take up direct actions. Mm-hmm. Uh, so take example, one of the work that we were doing is uh, over the last uh, seven years was uh, end of life issues. You know, mm-hmm. How should one actually die you know, uh, in a city and with dignity? Mm-hmm. And in that issues, while the government was interested, there is still a lot of work for us to do in terms of building capacities of those agencies, getting the agencies to see where the issues are. So the problem is not just about learning how to talk about end of life, but we are looking at systemic issues. Uh, if there's inequalities, mm. uh, people will be talking about end of life in a very different way between the middle class and the lower middle class and the lower class. Mm. And a lot of our projects deal with different strata of people and we realized that we have to use different strategies, engage with different agencies, try to help them or try to engage them so that they become part of the conversation. When you are working with, I mean, let's just a little bit more on the migrant workers. Um, you, I, I curtailed your completion of the story. I can see that working with migrant workers perhaps might be considered subversive by certain governments you have quite a you have quite a controlling kind of government uh, in singapore um what happened in the end with the um making 
forum theater illegal was was that law rescinded um or does it still continue do you have to call forum theater something else in order to get it done Co, oh, can you can you up speed us on that what is it yeah so so um well i, I didn't live through the start of that but i lived through the end so yeah. um actually 2003 something happened in singapore which is sars uh, right. the early outbreak okay, and uh, cool. during that time it was very interesting because uh, we uh, actually were working on another piece of forum theatre but um, in response to SARS we quickly uh, put together a piece and um, actually we toured the housing uh, areas about SARS and about the discrimination that the people who are uh, being uh, quarantined they were being faced etc so um and interestingly subsequently so so actually uh, prior to that we always had to apply in singapore to do any performance you have to apply for a performance license mm -hmm. so prior to that we can actually apply for a license to perform uh however there are a lot of uh, other um um uh, I, I would guess um how, how, how should i call it him uh Permit. Yeah, per oh. things that we have to put in place. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. To go through, sure. as it were. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, and and so uh, subsequently, actually, that uh, changed as we, we are not sure why too, but I think that was uh, actually a time, uh, a milestone time. Yeah, where it started to shift, and we could start seeing a uh, form theater perform, uh, or rather, the license to apply for it and to get funding mm. uh, to do it uh, more often. So that was the point where it actually. I think more visible for us to note that there is a change in that, right? Uh, there was actually a policy change uh, mm. in 2004, mm. uh, which is about 10 years later. Uh, what happened was that uh, the government realized that they wanted to do more engagement and mm. they didn't want to do more interactive work. And when they realized that this could be done, uh, they sort of uh, stepped back and there was a censorship review committee. So every about every 10 years, you know, there's a censorship review committee. And this policy was being reviewed and then the uh, that ban was rescinded, which means uh, you can get uh, grants and you can get, uh, you can, uh, you can perform. All along you can perform. It's just that, you know, you will not get any support from the states or from any agencies. So by 2004, we could do it again. Uh, so, so the yeah. primary the primary restriction on your activities was actually that it was very difficult at that time to get any funding to yeah. support such projects, and that's changed. Uh, I mean, I don't know whether we should be disappointed that the state now considers forum theatre less of a danger to them. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I mean, this is an interesting point, Heng. It's one of the things which has come up several times in our conversations with other practitioners has been notions of compromise. Mm. Um, the extent to which we feel we do or don't compromise, as it were, or our work be compromised by allying ourselves by um, your funding mm. comes from the government now. Is that correct? Mm. And does that make you, does that limit your output at all or your choice of subject matter? 30% uh, of our funding comes from the government. Uh, so we have to find out our 70%. Right. Uh, I think there are moments whereby, I think, you know, you, you will worry whether, you know, what you do would affect government funding. And I think that's always on top of our head. In the background, uh, right. It's always, always that. So I always call this as sleeping with your enemy. And right. you must prepare at every moment to fight with this enemy if you think that it sort of uh, compromised with your integrity. Uh what the funding allow us is to decide on certain projects to be funded by government and to put the government uh, a logo there. And certain projects, if we feel that you know the government is not happy, we probably will not put a government logo there. And w would you still be able to do those projects, but just not involving the government's funding? Is is that? There are certain projects that we got. Uh, we've done, for example, many years ago we were doing the vagina block, our own version of vagina monologue. Mm -hmm. The government received the funding and we continue doing it. For example, we were doing, uh, before the government uh, rescinded their policies of uh, supporting foreign theatre, mm -hmm. for many years, we were, for about three years, we were, three to four years, we were doing foreign theatre on our own, mm -hmm. outdoor. Mm -hmm. So the police were around, they were looking at our work, mm -hmm. they were checking on our work, uh, but 
they couldn't stop us because uh, there was nothing really that you know they could go after. Uh, uh, the audience were well behaved. Uh, the the facilitation helped us to understand the issues. Uh, there were a lot of discussion. They they were worried that actually uh, because we, we we do it outdoor and we love to do it outdoor, so mm. they were very worried at one point that it would become rally political mm. rally. And we had to explain to them in great depth the way we design our space such that it is almost a arena space whereby there is conversation happening rather than it is a rally call or political yes, call yes. for action. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think what I learned over this many years uh, is that how we manage the space would give us a lot of uh, leeway or a lot of ammunition to discuss and actually to create safe space, both for the people participating, mm -hmm. as well as for the government to see, yes, you can do this kind of uh, uh, discussion as long as you are able to manage it within your, 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 your uh, you know, your... Yeah. No, your no. I mean, one of the one of the things, of course, Augusto was very fond of quoting um, Che Guevara, solidarity means running the same risks. And uh, I think he would have been the first to acknowledge that many of us aren't sometimes running the same risks. Sometimes we are, sometimes we're not. Very often we're not. Um, he wasn't always. Um, but I suppose it's a question and... Uh, in 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 you you weren't actually in danger of imprisonment i i hope but you your work could have been stopped is essentially it yeah whereas i guess in hong kong now for instance um there would be actually our friends and colleagues there danger of imprisonment and if if you know and and worse um before we we you see i told you this time goes incredibly quickly um but before we move to the um open space part there's already a number of questions logged up i wanted to ask you hang about uh, you became a member of parliament um, um, we all look at Augusto, who became a, a, a very ador in the Rio City Camera, um, and that's when he invented the legislative theatre. Mm -hmm. And you are virtually the only person I know in the whole world who has to some extent emulated that, because you were a member of Parliament for Culture. Is that correct? Tell us about that. Tell us about yeah. your mandate and what you did and how that worked. Uh, I... The, this 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 member of parliament position was not uh like unlike Boa where he has to go and campaign for it, uh is what we call as nominated uh member of parliament is a system in place by the government so that there are alternative voices, and and there are about nine NMPs and they all would represent different sectors of the society, and I was nominated by my community, uh to run as the uh, uh arts NMP so called. Uh, when I went there, I think uh, what I wanted to do very clearly was to do this, that, you know, not to see art as a kind of a, a commodity. Uh, it shouldn't just be an industry, but art being essential and art being a part of our everyday life. And not only that, but art do have a political voice. That art can speak about any issues, not just art issues. So as a as an NMP during that time, I made sure that I work closely with NGOs. I work on various issues from environmental to heritage to migrant workers to sex workers, uh, 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 developmental issues, uh, single parents issues, housing issues. So that in the end, while I present myself as a, as a member of parliament, but I am an artist, but an artist speaking inside the uh, parliament, but talking about all these issues, and for me, they are cultural issues. They are not just political issues, but they are cultural issues. So you're talking, I mean, your 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 vocation there was really to uh, help people understand how central art can be um, mm -hmm. in all these social, different social arenas. And uh, yes. so, so, uh, how, how long was your, was your tenure? Um, four it was years? two and a half years. Two and a half years. Yes. Two and a half years. And do you feel tempted to go into politics full time or was that like, I will never do that again? <laughs> oh, I will do that again. <laughs> you won't do that again. <laughs> 
um, and while that was going on, Co, the company was still continuing alongside. Mm. Um, um, uh, was that uh, what? What are the big projects uh, uh, that you've been doing over this period, really? Um, and and how perhaps did it relate to Hang? And could you feed them across? Uh, during during that time, actually, like what we were talking about earlier, that we um, using TO as the fundamental uh, philosophy of our work, but actually branching off to uh, creating and finding different participatory methods. Uh, so actually, during that period of time, we were also doing a lot of um, site-specific projects where um, uh, we actually go in, instead of focusing on a specific community based on interest or certain kind of similarity, we actually go into a geographical location and geographical area to see uh, and do, do interviews at the start, you know, really understanding and getting ourselves more uh, in tune with that community. And then from there, as the issues uh, start to emerge. So uh, like the first one that we did was uh, actually in a rented community in Singapore, uh, but it's actually in a very central location. Uh, and one of the oldest uh, that also had a lot of uh, public housing uh, significance during the public housing shift when in it, because it uh, the British left and then you know the Singapore um, current government still and uh, actually uh, developed the public housing scheme and that was actually a very big turning point uh, this uh, housing estate yeah so that that project was actually very much focused on the area and the stories that emerged from there uh, subsequently actually we also moved to another housing area where it was um, they were going to demolish the uh, one of the last entire estate of um, public housing uh, built by the British also. <laughs> and then uh, using that, because again, it's a very central location. Uh, so we were working with the, also a rented community, uh, many, many seniors and families with small children, uh, low income, uh, working with them to understand uh, the challenges that they have, uh, especially when uh, they were told to shift. So some of them have been there for like, I don't know, 20 to 50 years, depending. Uh, and then suddenly they had to shift to a much smaller house, but they are not sure how small and how and when they're going to shift. Yeah. So subsequently, uh, we also used um, other forms besides theatre. So I mean, our subsequent other projects, actually, like the end of life project as well, we started to include um, other disciplines like uh, music, visual arts, etc. Yeah, to further engage and getting uh, a lot more community participation yeah, through the different projects that we do. And when you, when you uh, are working with other disciplines, I didn't really ask, um, how many people is Drama Box? How many full-time people it is? And would it be freelancers you're working with when you're using mm. different disciplines? Mm. How many people is Drama Box full-time? Uh, full-time, actually, we have uh, four artists. So myself, Heng, and two more. Uh, and then we have one, two. Um, I, I always have to count the seating. Five, <laughs> Five administrative staff and uh, one part time, uh, half time uh, part, uh, accounts okay. person. Yeah. So uh, and so, those, uh, those artists are theatre artists, Co. Um, mainly, yes, yes, okay. yes. Our our groups are in theatre. So, uh, like you mentioned, we will, we will then uh, work with uh, artists from these other disciplines. So uh, on project basis. Mm. So like the seven-year project that Heng was talking about, then uh, it will be the artists. Uh, some of them will stay on for that long period of time. Some of them actually, you know, they finish a certain uh, period of time, maybe two, three years for one particular project, and then they move on. Yeah, so we rotate in that sense. So did you say that, did I miss here, did you say it's a seven-year project that you're talking about? about mm. The end of life issue. Mm. At the yeah. end of life. Okay, mm. we've got to come to the end of life in one moment. There's quite a few questions about that. Um, but there's one thing I wanted to do before that. You you mentioned, Co, of course, um, um, that you have had some experience in Singapore before we have. I'm interested for, from here, both of you, uh, because SARS affected Singapore uh, mm. seriously. Um, has that helped you in terms of your preparation for a response to, because we didn't really have SARS, it didn't happen here at all, mm. uh, either of you. Has that, has that helped in terms of your response to COVID? In terms of our, us as a community or the company itself? The company, I suppose, the company and its artistic theatrical response and, and the way it can interact. Mm. 
I, I think company wise, uh, we I think generally amongst the Singapore larger community, everybody uh had a lot more I would say alertness to the entire situation. So we were more uh ready in that sense that okay, this is right. something because we also actually have uh, over the last few years prior to that a uh, very bad haze situation. Uh, so you know, so so constantly we were either having masks already in our household or something like that. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think that part for the company it is. Yeah. Maybe he can talk about the other parts where we now are moving into the evolution of uh, our programs. I think uh, one of the uh, difficulties is that we cannot have physical uh, hmm. proximity. You know, uh, physical proximity is being compromised, and yet you know our work is very much. Uh, how would I say, uh, participatory, which means uh, physical proximity is, is important, right? Being close, yeah. uh, that is being compromised. But at the same time, uh, Drama Box has over the years developed in a way where we see ourselves as a socially engaged uh, group. So that engagement becomes important. So how do we still continue to do engagement? I think unlike in SARS, when we could just put up a play and go on the and do it, this time we couldn't. Hmm. So we had to rethink about strategy of uh, how to continue to engage communities that we work with or other communities that are in need. And interestingly, this time, I think uh, in Singapore, we see a lot of the NGOs, you know, really taking up the mantle. And in fact, they were very quick in responding to many situations. And so that leaves us at this moment as data company thinking, you know, what is it that we can do, you know, in order uh, to partake in this whole experience. Mm. Uh, I think uh, as a company, we decided then to allow ourselves that space mm. to have a critical distance, mm. to, to, to observe what is happening and to rethink about how do we, what we always call uh, as one of our main artistic strategy, do a call and a response. Where are the calls and where are the response? So take for example, uh, we realized that you know while while those uh like you know the the the, the migrant communities the issues are so real and there were so many resources going there already we didn't need to be there, you know. Okay. It could be in some other places. So for example, we realized that for example now uh, I'm dealing with situations whereby theater uh practitioner uh, theater uh technicians who are casuals who are falling through the crack of the that kind of, uh, of those financial support that the government is giving. <clears throat> and in fact, a lot of them are actually living through a very hard time. So that became something that we could do or I could do in order to support them and to help them and try to engage agencies and try to deal with the policies so that they can find, you know, they can get support. And uh, actually, this afternoon, yeah, quite please, these sound familiar uh, issues, saying, I mean, the, the issue of freelancers is, of course, very, very significant here. Yeah. Um, and it's a terrible and frightening time for many freelancers. And of course, we work with many, many freelancers and wish to do our bit to support them. I should start asking some of these questions before we run out of time. There's quite a lot of questions about the end of life work, the working with older people, uh, specifically. Uh, Peter Lindley is asking, uh, um, are you working with older people? If so, what are the issues they raise? Um, and he's also asking, can you expand a little on the work you're doing on end-of-life care? So this sounds like a large project. Yeah, it's, it's a huge project that started with a research uh, that was made by a foundation, a very progressive foundation, that realised that uh, Singaporeans are not talking about end-of-life. And in fact, uh, uh, a lot of them are quite worried about how their end of life process would be like. But yet, there isn't a lot of resources. Uh, so that that foundation approached us to create a kind of a project uh, to engage first the medical workers. In order to, I think one of the issues we found was that uh, medical science tend to be really uh, quite a. Uh, 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 dehumanized in a way. You know how, how we look at Western medical science in terms of organs and we look at departments are uh, urinology, you know. So they are about organs rather than about human beings. So how to humanize that process? So we were given the task to work with a particular hospital, engage the medical social, the medical workers, the social workers and the people over there to get them to have conversations about end of life. 
So we were supposed to create a project within there. And that hospital was a very progressive hospital. In fact, they gave us a lot of, uh, they opened many doors. We did a lot of research, interviews, and then we created an uh, installation over there for audience to experience, for, med for medical workers to experience. Uh, there were performances, uh, a verbatim piece. Uh, there were interactive work where people could reflect on issues of end of life. Mm -hmm. And then after that, we realized that a lot of elderly do want to talk about end of life, mm -hmm. but they don't know how to start the conversation. And uh, they didn't know how to talk to their kids. They didn't, know. and the kids are, of course, that's children. Why would I go to my mom and say, "Hey, you want to talk about end of life?" That sounds really, you know, unfamiliar. Uh, so that was that simple premise, which then evolved into other projects that we found ourselves in housing estates, uh, creating artwork that you know make a call for this for the residents to respond to whether they want to talk about end of life issues. So the, the, the goal, what, what's a good result for you here? Um, what's the change that you're seeking to achieve here? And how would it be readable? I think the two things, again, you know, one, whether the community feel more uh, safe or they feel that they have the skills to talk about this end-of-life process. Mm -hmm. Secondly, whether the agencies will create systems, you know, to support uh, the uh, the 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 end of life conversations uh in fact the agency whom we work with wanted more people to talk about it so there are also frameworks that, that we allow referrals from people whom we work with and then they'll go to hospital and they will look at some of their end of life process with the medical social workers with facilitators from hospitals some, somebody is asking conrad murray is asking what does end of life mean and i'm presuming it means death um, or the, the time when death approaches yeah. uh, the whole idea of dying. Is, the, is that a correct? Yes, from preparation of death to death and after death. Uh, preparation of death, that sounds grim and frightening. Explain to us preparation of death. Is, is that assisted dying? What, what is that? So, so there are issues like, you know, I think one of the things we don't talk about, like the kind of medical choices that we want. Say, for example, okay. if we are okay. in a stroke and if, do we want resuscitation? Do we want to have aided feeding? And, and all these are very important issues. Where do you want to die? Uh, is, is, this a, is, is, the, is this a political question or a sociological question? Or, uh, I think it's both. <laughs> and it's also an economic question. We, we realized that. Uh, after our third year, we then realized there was other very deep issues over there, especially people who come from uh, uh, families whereby they have less resources, who are poorer. They, they, they have no space to think about end-of-life issues because they were struggling every day how to live. Mm -hmm. And for these elderly and a lot of them who are living alone, they would just want to quickly, you know, end their life. Mm. Right. And that's where we talk about that part of their life, whether it's their dignity. So you are, when you're dealing with this, we're just not just simply dealing with this person's wishes. We're mm. also dealing with his or her everyday issues. And, and, and so this end of life issue then became very complex. So we're not just dealing with how you prepare, but at the same time, how you live your everyday and you find dignity living. Mm -hmm. I, 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 Peter, does Lindley again, this is, is his theme, so I'm just going to give him some last um, <laughs> space on this, but he makes the a very interesting point that, of course, in the UK, uh, COVID-19, uh, in his words, shone a searchlight into the darkest corners of care homes for the elderly in the UK, and we're still reeling from the magnitude of hidden, the shock of discovering the magnitude of hidden neglect of older people. So in, uh, I don't know whether that's also feeding into your, or will feed into your, um, your work in this area. Your previous associations with migrant communities presumably might stand you in quite good stead to understand how they were treated during this outbreak. Is that something, Co? is that something that uh, is happening or something that you plan to do or? Uh, at the moment, no, but actually we do have, a, a, I would say that a, a, a comrade 
who has worked on a project with us and subsequently developed her own uh, practice. Uh, actually, now in terms of COVID and care homes specifically, uh, uh, producing, because a lot of artists, like as we know, freelancers do not have uh, work um, because of you know the, all the limitations. And then uh, actually develop that. So uh, our friend has actually rallied a group of uh, artists to come together and create uh, content for audio, uh, mainly for seniors, so that um, they, some of them are online. Uh, it's actually available online, uh, but also uh, working with an NGO to come up with uh, MP3 players. So, uh, and then these MP3s are developed, uh, actually um, uh, brought to different uh, rented homes as well as actually care homes so that the seniors, because um, a lot of the social workers or a lot of the artists who used to go into care homes to do activities, they are now not allowed to go inside. So um, all these uh, MP3s of uh, audio, different kinds of audio stimulation uh, actually allows um, the seniors to have a, um, some companionship during these uh, very, very difficult times. Mm. Is the is the um where is the theatre of the oppressed in this? Is it? I mean, it doesn't have to be in everything. Is it part of this? I suppose. Uh, um, is there an oppressor? Um, um, are there oppressors um, that you can identify, or is it some kind of generalized thing? Society oppresses itself by being unable to speak of uh, death because it's a taboo. Um, mm. What's your where does this go? What's your finding so far? Well, I, I think uh, if we take critical pedagogy and talk about, think about it criticality, uh, then you, you are identified as a systemic oppression over here. The way right. the, uh, the, the society is organized where we are valuing a lot in terms of regenerating about, about life, about, about you know, constantly churning and producing that we do not honor the end experience. So to be human, it's not just about being alive, but you know, the end phase has also to be dignified. And so we realize that the current society, the capitalist society, the consumerist society, the whole productive society is really about creating and producing, but never honoring that process of how one should be looking at, you know, uh, our end or even the death. So, so, in a way, the work is a critique of mm -hmm. this uh, system. Mm -hmm. And to keep reminding that the system must think about uh, policies to honour a human experience so that we do not get humanized into products. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense what you're saying, and I fully understand the systemic nature of what you're describing. I suppose one thing which would, people would be interested in, how much do you see that crystallizing into, I mean, do you, for instance, use legislative theater or w might you use legislative theater at some point? You know, we are speaking to Katie Rubin last week, uh, mm -hmm. who's pioneered a huge amount of legislative theater with uh, Theater of the Press New York City, TNYC. Um, can you envisage, do you imagine using uh, legislative theater maybe to actually crystallize your findings into clear demands for legislation system changes? Actually, we tried it once, remember? We tried it once like, when we were dealing with gambling in Singapore. Yeah. It was so, I'm sorry, you were speaking at once. So, uh, Seiko, uh, what was it? What? Oh, oh, there was a project that we did, I think, in 2006, seven ish um, So, right. at, at that point in time, the Singapore government wanted to bring in casinos and yes. uh, yeah, and so uh, they call it integrated resort. And then uh, there was a lot of mumbling on the ground. And then we wanted, and then they, there was uh, there's this council, uh, government led council that was started. And we went to approach them and we said, you know, we think that it is actually quite a big issue, this uh, gambling uh, thing uh, in Singapore. And we wanted to uh, work on it. And then uh, actually, then they, at that point in time, if my memory doesn't fail me, is that uh, they were coming up with a white paper and then there were a lot of things that they were trying to clarify for themselves to put into a bill. And then, uh, so what we did was that we actually worked together with them and um, there were a few fundamental questions that we were asking through the performance and the play, uh, which is from theatre and then at the end of it, legislative, um, that uh, I, I recall one of the questions was, um, how do you actually define a problem gambler? 
So, and then subsequent, and who defines it? Is it, I mean, the problem gambler themselves probably wouldn't say, I am a problem gambler. You know, so, and then how do we de de determine that? So, uh, those were some of the questions that were embedded in the play itself. So, we went through the normal um, form theater route. And then uh, at the end of the performance, actually, it was designed that um, we came up with um, uh, actually ballot uh, boxes and then we had slips of paper. And then uh, we actually asked the audience these questions and then we had conversations and also getting them to write down uh, anonymously yeah. and then putting it into the boxes. Um, and we did a few rounds. Uh, at that time in Singapore, the social um, atmosphere of speaking out in public is actually still not there. So uh, a lot of people were very fearful once they hear that they had to write something and it affects a bill. You know, right. so uh, the idea of like, am I being traced and, and being contacted? So those were some of the questions that came up. Uh, but subsequently, we collated actually all the um, data that we collected from the audiences throughout that entire series of performance. And we actually worked with a lawyer to submit it formally and then uh, together with the bill uh, up to the parliament. So that was uh, one specific uh, legislative project that we did. Mm. True. Hang, did you want to add something on that? And, uh, or I don't. I think that's, 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 that's good. Yeah, there's a linked question, which is really perhaps you've already answered a bit from Rosa McCreary, uh, asking about uh, examples. You know, we're always we're always asked to prove our worth, aren't we? And perhaps it's good <laughs> that we're asked that, and perhaps it's difficult, challenging. Can you give some examples of the impact you feel or know you've had with the communities you've worked with, or on the political social landscape? Um, and the way the arts are used and, and viewed and decisions are made. Perhaps you've answered a bit of the second part, which was the effect on the political social landscape, you having been a member of parliament effectively. Are there other things you're particularly proud of in terms of impacts on particular communities? Uh, we, we, we just finished a project last year, the same end of life project with, uh, with a community in this uh, poor housing estate. Uh, you know, where they, the, the people are quite poor. And in fact, the, the, the area was so badly maintained uh, and there was not enough, there was no communal space where all these single elderly could gather. Mm -hmm. So when we were working with them, initially was just trying to see whether we could engage them in the end of life conversations. In fact, what they really wanted was to create a space and a place for them to feel belong. So the project then turned into a kind of a community building uh, development kind of project uh, and they started to create work with each other they started to give ideas on how to change that public space into a communal space and we adopted their ideas and we created mural uh, together with them we did a, an exhibition over there and in the process we keep engaging the uh, government agencies saying that you know this community actually needed that kind of support and the engagement was quite difficult because at some point these agencies were a bit suspicious of us. Why are we there? Uh, do you have political agenda? Uh, are you trying to you know uh, show some of the issues that you know we are not working well? We're not doing our work in, in that community. I think at the end of the whole project, what we have discovered was that that community and those residents who were involved with it, they continue to work together, they continue to support each other, uh, even during this time of uh, uh, COVID. And at the same time, we also realized those uh, agencies, uh, government agencies who are working there, have responded to their call, for example, to work more on that communal space, create more mural in order to enliven that space to allow things to happen. And I think that, that, that those, these are the things that uh, make us happy. But what makes us happier is when you realize that your relation, there's relation. I mean, in, in the end, the whole thing uh, is relational, no longer transactional. Uh, when you get invited into the house of these people, whom previously they will be very, very protective because they don't want you to enter into their place to see how they live. But then they are willing to open up their house for you who was a stranger previously, and now you can visit them, you can talk to them. And I think those are the things that actually tell you that that's where art can effect changes and create community and create uh, support and trust. 
So yeah, creating okay. community would be one of the one of your larger ongoing goals. Yeah. I noticed. <coughs> Co, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I was just going to add on. <coughs> I I think it's really to break that isolation that a lot of the oppressed um, people okay. do feel, and then yeah, building that community. Uh, that um uh, actually uh, through the entire uh engagement, but they were also another thing is that I feel that they feel uh uh that now. Actually, there is the potential and that hope to change. I mean, we talked about very a uh, lot just. I think the pedagogy of hope and the idea that actually they can do something. I think for me that is a uh, um, as in that they are capable of changing something, no matter how big, how small. It could be within the community, it could be personal. Yeah, so that is something. In, in the area of empowerment, then yes. um, we're we're coming to fairly close towards our end. Um, which means at least one thing, which is that I have to ask a ritual question, which I told you that a certain <laughs> person, Amit Ron, asks every week. And if he wasn't here, I would ask it anyway, because it's become part of the ritual. But it's interesting. I've noticed that you you don't use the word oppressor terribly much. You've used the word oppressed between you several times. Mm -hmm. um, and I suppose I'm slightly surprised at that because having started our conversation with how you were, how forum theatre was effectively banned um, by the Singapore government some 20 years ago, um, which you would have thought was a pretty clear sign of an oppressive state that the word has less used in your vocabulary. What, what's your attitude towards the oppressor? Who is the oppressor? What is the oppressor? How does the oppressor appear in your work? Uh, I, I, I noticed this as well. When we run the uh, TO of F, uh, from theater workshops in in Singapore, you know, because uh, you know there are activities where we ask them to create images of the oppressor, I realized that it's usually the one that um, they struggle a lot with. Um, to you know, uh, actually characterize it into a person. So, so that's um, so fascinating. Why, why, why is that then? I yeah, mean, are I, there I, is, I, is I, there a lack of oppressors in Singapore? Or? <laughs> I I also don't know why. Actually, that was um, and it's an observation over the many many years of uh, doing FT workshops in in different contexts. So sometimes in community spaces where it's very very mixed. Sometimes in schools with young people. It, whenever we say oh oppressed oppressed characters they can come up with it very very quickly but once we say uh, okay now create an image of oppressor it will take such a long time i i have no idea why it's very uh, it's very fascinating yeah okay. uh, but with facilitation sometimes it will slowly evolve yeah you 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 squeeze it out of them as well hang i'm very interested in your thought on that what 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 does it betoken that people find it so difficult to name or, or, or frame their oppressors in a society which I'm guessing is, is is at least as unequal as many of the other societies we function in around the world. <laughs> That's very interesting. I love the sigh. It suggests it's going to take quite a long time to explain, but go for it. Okay. I think that, uh, Singapore is, is, is a situation whereby a system was built since 1959 till now by the current government. They've built a system that allows us to prosper economically, mm -hmm. but yet within that system, there were a lot of oppressive uh, structures that has been built by this, uh, 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 this government. So what you can see here is that while the people are enjoying uh, the prosperity that comes with it, they also then become uh, 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 complicit to part of that system. Mm -hmm. So how do we identify this uh, oppression, especially the oppressor, mm -hmm. where in a way you do enjoy what has been given to you, and then at the same time, you know that they exercise huge power. Mm -hmm. How would you want to identify them and say, I want to get, I want to deal with you? Mm -hmm. This is really a very difficult relationship. Now, if, if this is a government that in the end doesn't you know, provide all those economic uh, uh, benefits to you, you can see the immediate uh, repercussion. Mm. But in this case, when you have been rewarded or you have been given the fruits you know, of their system and you are enjoying it at the same time, and that's where people start to worry. And in fact, in Singapore, there are a lot of middle class people. Mm. 
And you know the complex of being in the middle class is that you are caught in that system whereby you know that it is not quite right, but yet you are not there to, you, you don't think that you can change it and you become complicit to it and yet you want to get, you know, you want to move along that ladder. So what, what I, I mean, Quilling was right in the sense that it was difficult to get them to identify the system. But when they started to identify the system, the, the oppressor, they realized that they themselves are an image of some mm. systemic oppression, mm. as oppressor. Mm. And then they trace further, then they realize that they're dealing with a government who is also, in a way, creating the system and who holds the major uh, power where resources are very much controlled by this government. So the word oppressor was, was you know, in the earlier years, in the 90s, when I was still practicing, you probably won't use the word. But I would say that over the last 20 to 30 years, I've seen a shift and a change. So, for example, in the early years, I probably wouldn't talk about pedagogy of the oppressed. Mm. Uh, I, I managed to talk about pedagogy of the oppressed in the parliament. Yeah. I could talk about that. Now, even when I'm teaching the class, I could be talking about uh, uh, materialist dialectics, you know, Marxism, which in the 80s and 90s, you can never even talk about. I think we're so, looking at a society that is changing slowly. Mm -hmm. So this is just part of the evolution of Singapore yeah. society, a, you know, a post-colonial state uh, in, uh, finding its own voice gradually. Is it, would that be uh, would that be a proper? I'm not sure whether post-colonial is a word that we would use because we embrace the colonial government wholeheartedly <laughs> a still colonial state theoretically <laughs> yeah. Colonial. yeah but it's very interesting and we don't have so much time but you're talking i suppose about privilege really um which is a good thing for us to to round off with and you're talking about how perhaps to in some contexts um, and i remember from the early writings of uh, of Boal about this it's about helping us understand how we are complicit mm. with oppression. I mean, mm -hmm. when you work with an oppressed group like your migrant workers, they don't have a terrible problem understanding that yeah. they are oppressed. Mm -hmm. They know they're oppressed. But when you're talking about a society somewhat anesthetized by a very successful capitalist system, as you're describing in Singapore, um, that level of complicity is difficult to unpack. And perhaps that's the sort of primary role then of TO in, in that particular cultural context yeah, is yeah. to broadly help people understand how we are all complicit, mm -hmm. uh, which is a which is a good thing to think about in um, in in this Black Lives Matter time. Um, I'm going to ask very quickly one last question because I, I don't want to ignore it. Um, and uh, I, I'm going to ask it from my colleague, Terry O'Leary, and she's asking, uh, is the family unit also taboo uh, uh, along with gender? Uh, what are the taboos, really, that you're dealing with? You've got about a minute to answer this, sorry. Um, um, what are the taboo? What are the taboos? You haven't spoken terribly much, actually, about women's issues, mm -hmm. the position of women in that society. Mm -hmm. um, you've spoken about end of life. Who would like to try one of those briefly? Um, Dive in, one of you, please. Well, if, if we look at the low-income community, right, that we, we actually usually work with a lot, uh, a lot of them, uh, you do see the mother playing a very, very huge role and being very trapped in a certain kind of uh, structure, be it um, uh, societally in terms of um, the systems that were being provided, social assistance, etc., or it actually even the family unit of them having to uh, take up the entire responsibility. So um, that is something that uh, actually, there, I mean, there are mushrooming more and more groups in Singapore uh, trying to, uh, using uh, from theatre to uh, work with different communities. And there is one particular um, NGO actually uh, who engages uh, artists who practice um, from theatre and there's one particular group uh, here uh, who actually work with the low-income community and actually the women and the children uh, are their primary target 
uh, in creating uh, farm theater projects and shows on year on and on. I think it's been about uh, five, six years that they have been creating different projects, um, mm. drug issues, etc. Mm. Good to know that multiplication of uh, forum is happening there. Hang, I think you have the last word on any subject you like. It could be that or anything we haven't covered at all because oh, we're at the uh, end just of about the marginal group, rice group. I think uh, the LGBTQ. Mm. Uh, that's, that's really important. And tomorrow in Singapore, we have a pink dot whereby we celebrate the uh, pride. Uh, but you know, it's 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 controversial business because in Singapore, the three sentences A, whereby mm. that would decriminalize uh, homosexuality, uh, is still a law here, and that really needs to be dealt with. Mm. And yeah. <laughs> So when you're, yes, that's a grim note to end on. So when you're working on an issue like that, you would collaborate with an NGO uh, or um, an LGBT group or, or, yeah. Yeah, you would have to work with them. I, I think I think we, we as data company, at some point, we have to think about, you know, working with more and more agencies in order to create a kind yeah. of critical space. Yeah, yeah. That's exactly where we've arrived at in a kind of way we can lend our power as theatre makers um, and collaborate with others who can, as it were, do the end of the job. It's been a total pleasure talking to you both. I knew we'd have far too short a time. That is our hour done. Uh, but it's also just lovely to catch up with both of you. Um, and people who are listening now, please continue to ask questions. Um, they'll come up afterwards. Um, and uh, looking forward to speaking to you again soon. Thank you so much, Heng and Ko, for joining Thank us. You. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Good you, everyone. Good night. Oh, Good night, Good night. here. <laughs> um.